working. Um, super. So hi, everybody. Welcome to the next webinar in um, the ongoing series presented by the Society for Psychotherapy Research, um, or SPR. Uh, my name is Natalie Pochmet, and I am one of the uh, two webinar coordinators for SBR's Communications Committee. Um, and before I formally introduce our wonderful speaker for today, I want to give just a little bit of information about um, the meeting format, uh, our society itself, and then I'm going to put up a brief poll uh, to get a sense of who we have in our audience today. Um, so first off, I want to let you all know that we are recording this talk. Um, as we do with all of our webinars so that they can eventually be posted to our YouTube page and website. Um, so this is why we're keeping everybody's camera off. Otherwise, I would need to follow up with everybody who had a camera on um, to get their consent for recording. Um, so with that said, if you do have questions during the webinar, um, you can use the raise hands function on Zoom um, and feel free to private message me if you're having difficulty finding uh, where that function is. Um, or you can also enter questions into the chat. Uh, we will be holding all questions until the end of the talk. So when we do reach that discussion time, um, if you raised your hand, I will unmute you so you can ask your question out loud. Um, or if you type it into the chat, I'll go ahead and read it out. Um, and we might ask if, if there's any further clarification needed, um, if you might be able to unmute yourself. Super, so that's kind of the basics of structure. Um, if anybody does have technical difficulties or other questions, please feel free to direct message me. Um, and so I'll now take just a couple of minutes, hopefully speed through this um, to talk about our society and the benefits it does offer. If you're already a member of SBR, you can tune me out for a couple minutes here, but I just wanna let folks know because the webinar is open to non-members as well as members um, that SBR is an international scientific organization that is devoted to promoting psychotherapy research across theoretical orientations, professional disciplines, and treatment modalities. Um, for researchers, clinicians, and students alike, SBR has a lot to offer to its members. Um, so in addition to this series of free webinars, for instance, that is open to the public, um, SPR hosts a number of workshops across different uh, regional chapters um, that would only be open to um, SPR members. Um, and these include some CE eligible workshops as well. Um, one of the biggest benefits of joining SPR is belonging to a welcoming, diverse, and open community of professionals, all united by an interest in psychotherapy. Um, and there are lots of ways to connect and network with other members. Um, so there are email listservs for the international membership, regional chapters, as well as for uh, student or early career members. Uh, the International Society has an annual meeting um, to disseminate and discuss cutting edge research. Um, we have a student activities committee to keep early career folks engaged, and we're working on expanding our presence on social media. Um, so feel free to find uh, SPR at any of the um, tags on the screen here or visit psychotherapyresearch.org um, at our website. So. Um, with all of that said, now that you know a little bit more perhaps about um, the Society for Psychotherapy Research, we'd like to learn a little bit more about you. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch a poll here. If you can fill out these four quick questions, we'll get a sense of who's in our audience today. I don't know, maybe Andrew, you can tell me, are you seeing the results as they're coming in or with, okay. Great. 
Super. Yeah, it's looking like we have a range of geographic regions represented, um, professional roles. So that's really great to see. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, everyone. And I guess maybe now I'm sharing the results. Okay. Fabulous. Well, in that case, without any more ado, um, I'd like to introduce today's speaker and let him take it away. Um, so today we'll be hearing from Andrew McAlevey, PhD, who is an instructor of psychology in psychiatry at Wal Wal Cornell Medical College um, in New York, and currently a researcher at the Hills of Ford, um, you know, hopefully I didn't butcher that, hospital uh, in Norway. Um, Dr. McAlevey earned an SPR Early Career Award this past year um, and is currently an associate editor as well at, at Psychotherapy Research. His talk today is going to touch on broad themes of psychotherapy research methods, um, drawing on his work so far on how to appro appropriately measure the difficult constructs we do um, and, and how he sees that going forward. And so even though our cam your cameras are off, please help me welcome Andrew with your uh, Zoom reaction of choice here. Um, thank you so much, Natalie. Thank you, SPR, and for everyone attending. Um, I am deeply honored to be invited to give a webinar to you all. Um, we've gotten so much from this society uh, and to see some of the uh, astounding uh, researchers in attendance here um, is quite humbling. So um, I hope that uh, my talk won't be terrible. I, I think it won't be. Um, I'm going to be talking broadly about measurement. Um, and I'm going to talk for basically an hour. Like I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to talk the whole time. Um, so ask me any questions you want at the end. Um, I promise that the best part of it comes last. Um, so if you feel like listening to the whole thing, I would really appreciate it. But also I think it's the most fun at the end, um, even though there's good stuff throughout from my perspective. Um, we're gonna be talking about measurement, um, which is a topic that a lot of people don't quite understand. And I won't pretend that I understand it perfectly either, um, but we don't understand it as a field very well. Um, and we really need to get better at it. Um, so uh, I hope that everyone is, is ready for um, some big topics. Um, okay, so before we go further, um, I don't have any financial interests. Um, I will be talking about a product that is sold that I'm affiliated with in non-financial ways. I do accept a very small gifts um, like coffee uh, from the organization that sells and profits in theory from this Norse feedback tool. It will be extremely clear when I'm talking about that and the rest of the time is really very general. Okay, but feel free to ask any questions about my role and um, potential conflicts. Um, also, I should disclose that I do have a black eye. That was not my plan for today, um, but my five-year-old jumped into my cheekbone with his skull and that is just what happens. So um, look forward to parenthood, those of you who are not yet there. Um, okay, so what do I actually want to say today? Um, I'm going to be talking briefly about what is measurement, what do we mean when we say that we have precise measures or valid measures, um, what does that mean in the context of science broadly and psychotherapy research in particular, um, and then I'm going to talk about what types of measurement issues, really broadly defined, um, tend to arise and cause potential problems when we're doing a couple of basic clinical inference tasks um, that most of us who see patients clinically or supervise or um, have thought about these issues do routinely um, with individual patients and with groups of individuals. Um, there are lots of points because measurement is such an important subject that we know so little about 
um, where I'm going to sound hopeless, potentially. Um, it's my attitude that awareness of our limitations and the limitations of our science is much preferable to simply ignoring the limitations of our science. Um, but there are some solutions. There are some really great methods out there um, that we do use. Many people on this call are experts in and uh, that I hope that as a field, we continue to refine. So um, we need to look at the bright side also. Okay, so why are we talking about measurement? I know that this is like a picture that only 10 people on the call at best. Right, understand that's okay. Um, when psychotherapy researchers, and I, I'm sorry to generalize about us all, but when most psychotherapy researchers or psychotherapists talk about measurement, they're really talking about one of two things, right? The first is how you develop a self-report questionnaire or a measure of some kind. And there's a set of basic tools that everyone has been taught for the past 70 years or so about how to develop a self-report questionnaire. You develop many items, you do some analyses to drop the ones that don't work. You establish some credibility, some, some credentials around how valid your measure is, and then you publish it um, and you're done with developing the measure. Um, the alternative is measure selection, which is very important in uh, clinical work in particular, because a clinician might want to know which measure should I use to assess this patient. And if uh, this is commonly talked about as if you're choosing items from a menu, which measure do you want to give to which patient? And, you know, if you only have enough money for one measure or only enough time in the clinical encounter, you give a very brief measure. But if you have a lot of time or there's a lot of support, like you're in an RCT, you might give a lot of different measures. Um, and then you never think about it again because you set up your uh, measurement schedule and everyone gets a bad read all the time. Um, so in both cases, the goal of talking about measurement is to not talk about measurement prototypically. Okay. Um, so most people sort of think about, well, I don't want to pick a measure that I don't want to spend that much time talking about how we define what PTSD is. I want to just have a measure and go. Um, and this is pretty standard in our field. I'm generalizing really broadly, I know, but I think that most people would rather not think about measurement, which is fine. We shouldn't always be thinking about measurement. And yet it's one of the most important things that we do as scientists. So first of all, before I start talking about what I think and anything else that I have you know, come across in my readings and things, you should know that there are real experts out there who have written quite a lot about measurement. If you don't already know that, if you don't recognize these two books, first of all, the one on the right, my hard copy hasn't arrived yet, so I haven't seen the chapter by uh, Kim and colleagues or by Stephen Baldwin and, um, uh, uh, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on my, my friend's name, um, <laughs> um, about uh, measurement issues and validity issues in psychotherapy research in particular, but it, the, the Bergen and Garfield handbook, handbook is just out. Um, there are, of course, classic texts on the subject of measurement from Clark and Watson to uh, Jane Lovinger's uh, 1957 treatise. And of course, the standards of educational psychological testing um, really are one of the, the best practice books. And so we should all be familiar with these, um, not quite like the back of our hands, but very, very familiar with how we design measures and what we mean when we say psychological testing. Okay, so really pay attention to those people. Most of this talk is from the three sources on the left. It's just extracted at different levels from Clark and Watson, Lovinger, and um, the Standards for Educational and Psychological Testing. Okay, I wanna take a step way back before we talk more about psychology to the role of measurement in science and the role of observation precision in science. So this sort of you know oily looking metal rod wooden rod is um, one of Galileo's first telescopes. Um, Galileo uh, used the telescopes that he made. He developed telescopes and was one of the first people to point them into the sky to observe that quite plainly, the moon is not a perfect sphere. These are his drawings in Sidereus Nuncius. And they demonstrated really unequivocally, right? That the moon is not a perfect sphere. And that sounds kind of boring now. Like it, it's almost a perfect sphere anyway. And like we know that it's not, and that doesn't matter. At the time, this was a revolutionary finding. And he was able to observe this because he could, for the first time, see in much better resolution than the naked eye what was going on, you know, miles and miles in, into the sky, 
And this leads to important theoretical discovery. Um, right? and, and this is one of the observations about the progress of science over time is that improvements in precision of observation, you know, measurement, um, tend to precede major changes in theory. Um, and so if you fast forward a few hundred years, we have not his handheld telescope, but the Hubble Space Telescope that can literally look, you know, almost 13 billion years into the past and see the shapes of galaxies from less than a billion years after the Big Bang. This is really amazing precision improvement in science. Right? Um, and it reflects a lot of important changes that have happened in those hundred years, but it also propels changes. The specific picture on the right here is the Hubble Deep Field, um, which was the result of basically pointing a telescope at the darkest part of the sky for 11 nights in a row. Um, and putting that together, revealing that you can, in fact, detect galaxies with these incredibly precise tools. Um, this is truly amazing. Right? Um, in general, in science, our measurements tend to move from the variable to the more standard and more precise. Um, and we can start with really the most basic measurement and the most basic measurement tool, which is the foot, right? So um, across a few dozen different cultures, apparently, um, people needed to measure how far away different objects were. How big is your farm? How, you know, how far away is that book? Something else, whatever they, they needed to measure people. It's convenient to use a foot to measure this. We all have feet or most of us have feet. Um, they tend to go with us wherever we go. Um, and they're all roughly speaking the same size. So even if you were not aware that people use a foot as an, a unit of measurement, if I told you that there's a tree about 30 feet away from you um, that you should go walk to, you could figure out which tree that meant just by looking at, well, my feet are about this big. And so I'm gonna look for a tree that's about 30 feet away. The foot is incredibly useful. Right, which is why everybody uses the foot still. No, that's not true. Right? Only America still uses what's called the international foot, which is very fun. Um, the problem with feet is quite obvious, right? Even though most feet are about the same size, <laughs> every foot is a little bit different. This is why Cinderella exists. Um, and so thanks to the French, we use the meter. The meter is, an, is a unit um, much like a foot, it's just a little bit bigger really. Um, but the, the difference between a meter and a foot that matters is that it's not tied to your body, right? It's, it's a really arbitrary standard measure, right? It's just something that's big enough to be meaningful on its own, that you can subdivide and have meaningful small versions and you can multiply and have meaningful big versions. It's a pretty arbitrary unit. Um, but the nice thing is that once you agree on what a meter is, you can go to every town hang up a meter, it's just a metal pole, and say, this is a meter. Everybody go measure your farms and measure your houses according to this metric. Um, and people did. And it turns out to be very useful to have something that is different from a body that everyone knows what it is. That's just sort of an abstract measurement. Um, but it, it turns out that once you have a lot of different towns with different metal rods, those metal rods are, that are off by just a hair each are actually different enough that some towns think their borders are bigger than others or, or that they encroach over a river or something else because they have different meters, right? And so you need to standardize. And so now instead of saying that a meter is the length of whatever the metal rod is in Paris, um, everybody knows that a meter is roughly you know, the, the distance that light travels in one 300 millionth of a second, right? So the distance is pegged to space time, right? That's another major advance of, uh, science that we have to think for Galileo in part. Um, so if a meter is one 300 millionth of a second, it turns out that what we really need in order to measure distance is we need to measure seconds. We need to measure time. And the way that we measure distance really comes down to tools like this. This is an atomic clock. It, it measures the vibrations, vibrations of cesium atoms um, which tend to vibrate really fast. <laughs> um, it's really good to measure cesium atoms, by the way. They're, they're incredibly reliable at, at vibrating really fast. They vibrate about 9 billion times per second. It's slightly different than that by convention. 
um, but it's about 9 billion vibrations per second that defines a second, right? This computer, this thing, Fox One, uh, defines a second, right? And it defines it incredibly well. It's actually the single best measurement tool humanity has ever produced is this, this clock right here. Its error is about one in every 10 to the 15 observations. Um, it is so accurate. It, it gains or loses a second every 30 million years. Okay, um, that is you know roughly on the order of, and then I had to do some back of the envelope math here, so forgive me. But if you could start two of these machines right at the moment of the Big Bang, like and just continuously power them through ever for all time, right now they would disagree with each other by about eight minutes. Right, that's how accurate atomic clocks are. That's how precise this measurement instrument is. Um, and scientists are constantly trying to make it better. Okay, there, there's lots and lots of plans to improve on this clock. We want it to be better. This is how our GPS systems work. And so any improvement at the tiniest scale of reducing error makes everything in our lives, every computerized part anyway, work better, right? That's really important. And so scientists are working to improve the measurement tool constantly. Um, and just for fun, I sort of converted this to what a Chromebox Alpha would be so that people could understand how accurate this is, right? The Chromebox Alpha of, of the atomic clock is absurd. It's, it's, it's literal, literally 14 orders of magnitude better than anything psychology has ever done. Um, and that's amazing, right? What does this have to do with psychotherapy? I hope some of you are asking that. Um, in psychotherapy, we don't have atomic clocks. We do a lot with pen and paper. We do a lot with factor analysis. We have a lot of Likert scales. I should say Likert, I suppose. Um, but we have a lot of these scales, right? These are self-report tools. And I'm gonna be talking almost exclusively about self-report. Most of the work I do relies on self-report. Most of the work most of us do relies on self-report um, or conscious thought at some point. Um, and I'm actually gonna end up making the argument that that's good. But, but we just need to recognize that it's not the same thing as atomic clocks and physical measurement. One of the reasons that self-report is hard is that every person has a very different perspective on even very simple words. So this is data from a famous study of American political analysts who were you know, trained professionals whose job was to identify possible future outcomes in the world. And they were asked to rate on a numerical rating scale of probability, how likely different probability adjectives tend to make. When I write a report and I say that something is probable, I think that reflects X percent of the time it will happen, right? And there's obvious trends, right? Some words are, you know, almost like almost certainly means that most people think it's extremely likely to happen, um, whereas highly unlikely is very unlikely to happen for everybody. But you see these broad stretches of spread between people where some people will say that if, if I describe something as probable, that means it has a 25% chance of happening. Whereas other people will say that if something is probable, that means it has a 90% chance of happening, okay? Um, to be clear, this is part of what makes self-report hard. It is not a self-report issue. Okay, this is just the issue of interpersonal communication is that I have ideas in my head, you have ideas in yours, we have to talk to, to communicate at all. And all of the procedures from my idea generation to word generation to you know, articulation are imperfect, let alone everything it takes on your end to discover what I mean, right? This is just the nature of understanding human beings is to know that we're, we have a big job. Um, in psychology, you might want to know, like, are the measures that we have more like feet or are we really able to measure cesium? And I think it's pretty clear. And, you know, I, you could make the same argument for fMRI, by the way. Like, I, I, I'm not going to because I'm interested in self-report, but you could, um, even in fMRI, that what we really have are feet here. If we're lucky, we have a metal rod that says meter on it, but we're really measuring feet. Right, and it's really different across every town. Um, just as another fun uh, point, point of fact that I meant to say earlier, but I think it's important to put out there for how much worse our measurements are. Um, 
if we took a typical scale with you know items that are unidimensional and, and Likert type and so on, we would need 70 trillion Likert type items to achieve the Kronbach's alpha that the atomic clock gets. So unless we are willing to administer 70 trillion items, we're just never going to get to that point of precision. This is okay. It really is okay. Um, because in psychology, precision is not the same thing as usefulness. In physics, in, in physical distance measuring, those two things are very closely linked, if not exactly the same. A measure that is more precise is more useful in physics. Um, but in psychology, it's just not more useful to a certain point in certain contexts for certain things to have 15 significant digits than it is to have two. It's just fundamentally not more useful for many of the tasks that we want to do, particularly in psychotherapy and psychotherapy research to have that level of precision. And that's because we're doing different tasks. We're not measuring distances or time. We're measuring people. Um, when we measure people, we don't measure just one thing. We're not just measuring length or seconds. Um, we're assessing lots of different things. We're assessing lots of different things that overlap or are hierarchical in different ways. Um, we're assessing the same construct across different people or assessing the same person across different times. Um, we're assessing people in different contexts of cultures and gender identities and um, diagnostic and treatment courses. Um, there's lots of reasons why measuring one thing in psychology is simply not the same thing as measuring one thing in physics. Um, and so it's almost miraculous that we have any precision whatsoever. Um, but what do we have instead of precision that actually matters? And what most people would say in psychology matters in psychological measurement is validity. So how valid your measure is, is really closer to precision in physical measurements. So what is validity? Um, this is different than what I learned in grad school. I was in grad school not that long ago, I promise, um, even though I have kids and I you know, <laughs> have gray hairs. Like it, it wasn't that long ago, but this is, there have been developments and the psychometricians haven't been as persuasive in developing their theories for the masses as maybe some other branches of psychology have been. Um, the theory of unitary validity says, validity is a total accrual of evidence. It's an inductive summary that tells you how much evidence, theory, theoretical, and consequential support of using a specific score for a particular interpretation, right? This is, that's basically Sandomasic's uh, formulation. The focus of validity, really importantly, and many of you already know this, is on scores and their inter the interpretation of scores, not on the instrument itself. So even though you can still find hundreds, if not thousands of papers published every year that say that they developed a valid and a valid scale for uh, you know, assessing depression, um, that is technically not an accurate statement, right? You have a scale that is valid for a particular in inference in a particular setting with particular patients because the scale score is what you're validating, right? Um, and this is consistent across you know, informal and very formal writing about validity including in the guidelines of one of the, the Bibles of this type of work. Right? Validity is the degree to which evidence and theory support interpretation of test scores for the proposed use of tests. It's a very useful test measure. Um, I'm gonna use Samuel Messick's uh, work to sort of illustrate some of the parts of what validity is, even though validity is one thing that is sort of a summation of lots of different parts, uh, the different parts are important to keep in mind, particularly as we move towards psychotherapy. Um, the most well-known of these is construct validity. Construct validity is essentially the idea that you wanna know if your score measures what you think it measures. Um, and almost all of the empirical research on measure development, on construct validity, uh, it, or on measure development and validity of instruments, so-called, is on construct validity, okay? This is what most people think of when they think of validating an instrument the construct validity of test score. Um, the relevance and utility of a test, um, and in this case, the clinical utility, because we're talking about psychotherapy, is the appropriateness of that score for a particular application, right? You can have a very construct valid test score or um, item response that is very not useful in a particular use or use case, right? Um, so uh, for instance, uh, you might have the math test question four, four plus three, 
right? If I ask everyone on this call what four plus three is, everybody would get it right. Um, but if I ask a group of, I think maybe three or four year olds, some of them would get it right and some of them might not. Um, and so there would be a useful t test question for discerning math abilities among some people, but completely invalid, completely useless for discerning math abilities in others, right? So for those of us on this call, we're all nerds. And so we can add four plus three, whereas people who are only becoming nerds like our children, um, they might not be able to. Um, I'm seeing some writing on here and I don't know if I can erase that or not. Someone scribbled on the screen. I don't know if people can see it. Um, okay, I'll ignore it for now. Um, the other aspect of test validation proposed by Samuel Messick and widely supported in the field still, um, but lesser known is consequential validity. Um, and this is really what is the effect of using a score in a particular instance. And an example of invalid consequential uh, basis of evaluation for a test is this um, so-called voter literacy test given in Alabama in the 20th century, um, which was largely a tool to discriminate against African-Americans and prevent them from voting. Um, it was nominally a test of literacy and it you know, asks some questions that are theoretically about reading comprehension on some level. Of course, the downstream effect is that anyone who is given this test fails it. Um, and it was only given to people who were African-American. And so the consequence of this test use was that fewer literate people got to vote, um, which even if that's the law, that is a psychometrically invalid testing use case because the consequence is so counter to the stated goal. Um, it's also obviously morally reprehensible, um, but it's, it's separately psychometrically invalid. We should dislike it because of its moral implications and its value implications. Um, not just its psychometric ones, um, but those are part of the same validity question. Um, okay. Um, okay, so if psychotherapy has something to say about validity, the use of a measurement in psychotherapy is simultaneously as it were tending to use it is an instance of consequential evaluation. So that is, if you are using a measure in psychotherapy, the user experience, the therapist, the patient, the administrator, all of that is part of the validity. Um, and so obviously, even though we don't wanna look for a valid scale, we need to be thinking about given a specific inference that, I, that you want to make, what evidence and theory support the scale score? That's an inductive question. You have to take separate information, make a general statement about what would be helpful. And then you have to make it specific to that person in this use case. So for this patient, how confident can I be in the consequences, right? If I make this choice, what values does it imply and, and will it enforce in the future, right? These are actually uh, very real questions that psychotherapists and patients provide lots of feedback on as soon as you start introducing measurement. Um, and there are things that I think people could use quite a lot more discussion of as validity issues. So we're not just gonna say that we have a, a measure that's valid for psychotherapy because not every measure is valid for every psychotherapy case. Okay, that doesn't work anymore. All right. Um, so I'm gonna talk about two inferences that most psychotherapists make, I think. Um, and then we're gonna talk about, you know, what types of evidence might be relevant and how confident we should be in, in the different conclusions that they come from and different consequences that they uh, invoke. And the two, uh, inferences that I think most psychotherapists make at various points are really prototypically at the beginning of treatment and towards the end. And so the first is, what are the main problems facing this patient? Right? What are sort of the, this is the task of an initial assessment typically, that you wanna know what the, the central complaints are and the chief problems and you want to come to some diagnostic outcome perhaps, but you need to know what the main problems are, meant to be broad. Um, and then later on, we'll talk about has a patient improved or not, which is a question about change and measuring change is um, notoriously difficult. Um, but as I said, that's also the most fun, uh, so stick around. Okay, so we covered a lot of ground from, you know, 13 billion years ago to sitting down with a patient for their first session. Um, and we're going to talk about what it means to try to measure what are the main problems for this patient. How do we develop a measure for that? Um, one thing to notice about this 
question that I think most psychotherapists or psychological assessors ask themselves pretty routinely is that it implies that there are several targets of measurement, right? It implies that there are several that we're going to be assessing and only some that are important as well. Um, but it implies first we're gonna assess several different things. Okay? It's not just one question most of the time. Um, this means that in order for an assessment to be valid, meaning most useful, Overall, that it, the assessment has to include the most common or most important, you can decide how you wanna characterize the qualifiers on this, but it has to include some of the problems that are most valuable most of the time, right? This is the question of content validity. Does your measure capture the universe of problems, of universe of targets, of universe of constructs that you are interested in sufficiently well, right? Um, usually this is going to be commonality or severity or importance in a setting. Um, because we're using a lot of different targets, it's going to be helpful to have summary scores, right? These are subscales. We are going to try to summarize the information that we get across lots of different dimensions into fewer dimensions, maybe one dimension, maybe several, um, but we're gonna to try to summarize it. Um, that will help our validity because that will increase the usability of a score um, in the clinical practice. And for this type of process, almost all of the evidence that people ever look at is between person. Um, so that is differences between people, usually covariances across several constructs, usually factor analysis is very typical. And for this use case is actually, generally speaking, quite appropriate. Um, but it, again, it depends on the specifics of the questions you're asking. Um, I promised myself I wouldn't give you a recipe for how to create a test. Um, that is valid because of course you can't create a test that is valid, but there are some very common steps. Um, this is sort of a uh, paraphrasing of some of the best uh, well-known standards in the field. Um, and what I just wanna note about this is that it's iterative. There are stages, you identify targets, then you test them, you do some changes, you test them, and it could go on for a long time. Um, usually it ends in some publication of some version number or something else. Um, mostly what psychometricians are interested in these days uh, during the initial development phases is what's called unidimensionality, which is actually a kind of confusing subject, even though it doesn't have to be. Um, this does mean what it says it means, which is all items should reflect the same target, right? This is something that ideally those items also only reflect one target, although that's impossible, which is sort of one of the paradoxes of unidimensionality. Um, but the idea is that if we're going to summarize a scale, they all need to be related to one underlying construct. This is not, by the way, the same thing as internal consistency reliability, um, chrome box alpha, et cetera. Um, but it is essential if we're going to interpret a numeric summary of qualitative information. Okay? Um, and so that is that if you have two items that measure totally different things, um, you can't really compare a summary score between two patients. So if I tell you that a patient has a, a Macaulay score of seven and another patient has a Macaulay score of eight, you wouldn't know how to phrase those. You, know, you wouldn't know how to interpret those unless I told you that the Macaulay score means one construct, right? It means depression. Um, if I tell you that it means the combination of depression and eating pathology that is sometimes seen in inpatients in my particular hospital, um, then if someone has a seven and someone has eight, it could be eating problems or it could be depression that's more severe for one or the other, and you don't really know how to compare those two scores. But if they're unidimensional, you can make that work, whatever it is. Um, and overall, unidimensionality is more, more and more highly praised over the last 30 years. Um, it's become one of the central pillars of psychometric test development. Um, so I just said we're talking about unidimensionality, but we're assessing lots of different constructs and we are always assessing lots of different constructs in psychology, right? Even if we want a, a unidimensional measure and even if we only want one unidimensional measure, there's always more than one. Um, and this is a point made by Clark and Watson who give the example of an item, I woke up much earlier than usual. Um, they show, and, and empirically and, and theoretically show, that you can use this item as a valid indicator in a unidimensional scale for terminal insomnia, general insomnia, depression, and internalizing pathology, which would also extend to so-called general psychopathology. Um, 
And there's no inherent contradiction in this, is that each one of those could be a unidimensional measure um, from the same item. Right. That's not contradictory in the same way that sort of a physical measurement has to be just one thing at a time, um, because the items are multidimensional because our scores and the behaviors that lead to them are multi-determined. Right? People are determined by lots of different factors at all at all times, and so one person's score on I woke up much early, earlier than usual could very well be the result of lots of different meaningful constructs. And the confluence thereof, right? So we have this interesting phenomenon, which is even our best unidimensional measures are in fact multidimensional at the lowest possible scale, um, not to mention the, the higher factor levels as well. Um, but that's okay. Like that's just sort of the nature of our measurements and um, arguing about the configuration of factor models and so on is actually quite tiresome after a while, um, even though it's also fundamental. Right, but we, we just have to accept that at some point our scales are unidimensional and multidimensional, um, and that that is both potentially a problem and potentially not a problem. If the multidimensionality is partially or mostly due to random error, then it's a real problem, right? If, if it's just sort of coin flipping, then it becomes a problem. But if, if you can explain it and if it, if it makes sense, then it's generally not. I want to give an actual psychotherapy example, so I, I was uh, going to give something on the CCAPS, which is a commonly used measure for counseling center students, and especially in America. Um, it has eight scales. It covers what clinicians in those settings reported were the most common eight set of uh, presenting problems in, the, in their domain, in their patients. And it has, it went through a pretty standard measure development process as I just laid out. Um, what I want to illustrate with this, even though I'm very proud of all the work that I did on this and all the work that all my, my colleagues on this, I think it's, a, it's actually quite a good measure in many ways. But what I really want to point out is that because of this unidimensional, multidimensional, fundamental problem, all of our dimension reduction tools are probabilistic. And it might work for most people at most times, but that doesn't mean that it works for every person at all times. Again, validity is about test scores. So even though the measure seems to have a pretty good basis for validity, it's going to be wrong some of the time. So how does that work? Um, well, this is sort of the factor analytic model of, of how you model between person covariance. Let's say we, want, we have a depression scale. It's indicated by five indicators of depression um, that are pretty common. Uh, and if you score them in a certain way, then you can come to a latent variable model that is unidimensional for depression. Um, and this is all based on between person covariance, which means that people who endorse the item related to suicidality at a high severity level also tend to endorse the item on being tired and lonely and sleep and sad affect at a high level um, across people, right? But people who are low on this tend to be low on all of them, right? That's basically what that means. Um, but because we can do this and score, score the measure, we have our sort of standardized me measure. And if we really, really standardize it and maybe use some different item functioning, then we can call it a meter and it's even more standardized, right? That, that's really good. We want the meter, that would be great. Um, and the CCAPS of course has lots of these things and I'm just showing you depression and eating disorders and these aren't the actual items um, from the CCAPS but they're sort of emblematic of this type of measurement. Um, and the factor model would say that there's a depression factor, five items, eating factor, five items. Those latent variables are correlated but the items themselves are just about one thing, each, unidimensional. Right, And if we validate this, then we have our standardized measures and one is a meter, one is a kilogram. They're not exactly the same, but longer things tend to be heavier maybe and um, heavier things tend to be longer. I don't know, but there's some correlation between those um, in general across objects. Um, again, validity is always a probabilistic statement and model uncertainty and model error, meaning the errors that, that happen, always happen between the true data generating process and our simplified statistical model uh, will always get in our way. Um, and I'm going to just show you one of the ways that I think is, is least well discussed, even though it's quite prevalent now, um, but I think it's just, it influences how I think as a clinician and as a researcher every day, and that's the ideographic filter um, promoted by uh, several people, including Peter Molinar and uh, Nestle and others. 
Um, and basically it says that the, even if there's a single best between person solution, it's not gonna be best for everyone and won't even work for some people at all. Um, even if you're measuring the exact same thing across people. What does that mean? So the between person covariance structure might well look like this. It's very clean. It's got red in the sort of teal side over there. Um, and that's could be thought of as sort of the best or the optimal or the average with average structure across the, the sample that we developed it on. Um, totally consistent with having an average model that works well for across the whole sample is the idea that there could be a person for whom their depression factor doesn't have any sadness associated with it at all but it does have body image and associated guilt related feelings. Um, but they just don't endorse being sad, they endorse feeling worthless because of the way they look and that those are related to depression, right? The thing that sort of is called depression for them doesn't have to do with feeling sad, it has to do with body image in a similar way. And similarly, eating doesn't have to do with body image, it has to do with how they restrict themselves, right? It has to do with a set of behaviors that they take only to restrict their, their intake of food in different ways or, or their, their, their caloric balance, right? Um, that's entirely consistent with having the previous best fit model. Um, just as it would be entirely consistent with having a separate person who has a totally different, more complicated model with you know, a cross-loading item here and there and suicide suicidality that is, you know, moves on its own seemingly much more um, variably than either depression or eating disorders and that depression and eating pathology might not be closely related at all for this person. So on average, they're highly correlated. Um, and it could be totally the case that there are people for whom a single factor of pathology works for those items, right? All of those three within-person structures are totally consistent, theoretically consistent, and then you could create simulated data sets that would contain them with the between-person model I showed before, which is so clean and separated, right? And, and this is the question, like, so then does everyone need their own measurement model, even if what we're measuring are the same items and we're trying to measure the same underlying latent constructs of depression and eating, eating problems, right? Even then, if we restrict ourselves to just those, those things, maybe everyone needs their own personalized model, right? And this brings us to personalized measurement, which, just like everything uh, under the sun, right, is, is not new. This goes back 70 years and longer, um, which is the idea that people might need their own measurements. It goes you know, at least to Cattell's P technique, if not, um, and before then as well. Um, but I, I'm super briefly going to be touching on this. Um, the implications for validity are, are basically a proposition as follows. The more distinct the individual is from the group, the less valid the between person model is going to be, meaning the scores for them from the between person model are less meaningful, right? This actually makes perfect sense in, in person because if you are treating a patient who basically responds to all of these items the same um, and tells you, yes, I felt more depressed because I was also struggling with my eating disorders today, um, you actually should add all those items together and score them as one construct for that person. If, if you know, you would need to then look at for, for evidence that, that supports that, but that would be the optimal solution in theory for that person, right? Um, but if they're very similar to the between person, there's just one or two items here and there, it's not a huge threat to validity. Um, but it's, so it's really a question of gradation there. How much of a threat is it depends on how different the specific person is. Um, and these very personal models, the models that sort of generate the types of data where you can really tell them apart, individuals apart, um, cost a lot of time and effort. They're methodologically challenging so that they're not um, consistent across research groups or findings. There's really interesting work here. And by definition, they're not generalizable, right? These are person-specific models for a reason, and that's okay, right? And I wanna be really clear is that even though these come with lots of costs, um, this probably is some of the most exciting research that's being done in psychology that I know of, um, is on how to do these personalized models. And if people are really as different as some people seem to be, um, we all might just need to adjust to these costs. Like that just might be what we need to do. We're not quite there where we can say that that is what we need to do, um, but we should be willing to pay these costs if we have to. 
Um, there are, however, some intermediate models worth, worth being aware of. Because even though people are different from each other, we are not completely unique, right? Feet are pretty similar to each other, right? Most people's feet are within about a half foot of everyone else's feet in length. Right? That's a little bit of a way, confusing way to put this. Um, but, you know, snowflakes, even though they're all unique, are all snowflakes, right? It takes actually quite a lot of work to see them different. Um, and so this question is, even if everyone is different, are they completely different? Or can you use some information from everyone else to inform the person specific? Um, and there's really two major things that I'm just sort of shouting out here as really excellent domains, and even more exciting to my mind than the purely personalized uh, models, which are sort of this structured patient generated outcome measure. Uh, model, which I'm including as partially personalized because they have a pretty standard method for developing personalized measurements, even if the patient gets to write their own questionnaires, gets to identify how much change or what their goal of treatment is entirely on their own. There's a structure to how that information is elicited. And so it's partially personalized and partially standard. That's my definition, not necessarily have a remote degree. Um, and then there are sort of covariance models and other statistical models that try to balance between and within person variability, which uh, there are many variants of. Um, and that I, I think, again, the most exciting work to be done is about how we integrate between and within person variability on these issues. Um, the way that I've tried to do this type of work and, and that I, I wanna mention super briefly um, is, by really thinking about how a clinician goes about doing their assessment. And again, this is fairly generalized. It's also fairly naive. There are lots of ways to do a clinical assessment, I know. Um, but I, from my experience, from my training, from the things that I have read in the literature and in the research um, structure, there's, there's really a few things that most clinicians tend to do when they sit down with a new patient, which again is the inference we're trying to assist here is what do we do with a new patient? Um, the first thing is before they sit down with a patient, they have a model in mind of how people work maybe, or what types of problems are most common, um, or sort of the types of things that they can treat. They have some expectation for what they need to assess, right? Something, some theory or, or evidence or history suggests that there's some context for this assessment. They don't go in blind. Um, most clinical assessments that are structured and that have evidentiary basis and validity assess many different topics relatively shallowly, at least at first, right? There's a, a list, a checklist, or sort of a structure of, you have to go through the mood disorders and the anxiety or the anxiety, then the mood or the obsessive first or something else. Um, you have to get through this or the, the personality domain, whatever it is. You're moving through sort of many topics quickly to get a sense of what else is there. And then you're assessing a few topics more deeply. And this is true in structured assessments like the SCID and the ATIS, um, which have you know, stop out rules and um, you know, further you know, optional set sections. Um, but generally you're gonna be assessing the disorders or, or areas that are most problematic, most distressing to the person or most severe um, or most in need of treatment, whatever, the, whatever that qualifier is for your setting. Um, and good assessments, trust base rates and population models. They trust evidence that's not just in front of them at that moment. They trust the evidence that accrues over time from similar people and from similar uh, settings, right? So that is, if you see someone who's struggling with identity and they're a 20 year old person who's never been in treatment before and you're in a college counseling center, like it could be dissociative identity disorder, but that's really rare. And it, it is not the most common explanation, right? It could be normal adolescent identity development, or it could be emerging personality disorder, or it could be any number of other things that are considerably more common in base rates and in that population and in that setting. Um, and so even if it seems like that, you sort of wanna be convinced to move beyond the base rates, not just trust the individual observations you have, mostly. Right? There, there's, there's obviously a balance there and you need to, to pay attention to the individual, but trusting population models and base rates is part of a good assessment in my estimation. Um, this is the part where I talk about the Norse, which again is for sale and makes some people money. Um, I don't know if it makes Christian and Sam any money, but these are the inventors of it, the, the, the initial concept. I've been working with this group for, um, I think almost six years now. Um, 
And this is a partially adaptive, partially responsive um, clinical assessment tool for psychotherapy in mental health settings, um, where we sort of embraced the uniqueness of the clinical assessment process, right? We say, well, you like eight scales, how about 20 or more? Um, and we get those 20 scales by having extremely narrow targets, which is actually a very valuable piece of information because that tells you we don't have a depression scale. We measure sad affect, we measure sleep functioning, we measure somatic anxiety, we measure fatigue and pain and things like that. But we don't necessarily assume that we need to add all of those different narrower targets together, right? There's separate narrow targets, which can be more unidimensional, which can be less equivocal across people. Um, and all of them are consciously available, right? So that means that they're appropriate for self-report. You know, we're, we are not proposing any subconscious or empirical keying um, that is different from what some a patient wants to convey to their therapist. Um, and we're explicitly trying to help therapists make the inference, what should I talk about with my patient right now, right? What is the, the focus of a session that I want to make? Um, it's not personalized. These are structured psychometric scales. And when I say that it's responsive, it's in, in the current version, it's only responsive after the first session. Um, and responsive doesn't mean adaptive fully in, in a computer adaptive sense, although it has a, a relation to that. Um, it really sort of turns scales on or off. You either answer a full scale or you answer one item from that scale. Um, and with that relatively simple structure, there's actually more than a million different configurations of measurement that occur because there are 20 scales. Um, and so it's actually two to the 20th power of unique uh, assessments that someone might trigger over the course of their um, treatment. Um, there's obviously a lot of math here. It, the math isn't gonna save us, right? This is not a case where we need more math. This really is the case where the math sort of supports doing something much more parallel to a, to a clinical assessment in the way that I just described. I mean, it sort of covers a lot of ground broadly and shallowly and then digs in deeper. And all of that stuff is, is really just in support of, of meeting the simple task of identifying the chief problems. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna walk you through this work, even though I really liked it and I think it's valuable. It was just published this year, um, actually officially in print or it just came out um, in quality of life research. Um, and there were actually uh, two or three studies in that session, in the special section on the NORS feedback in, in different capacities. Um, the quantitative and qualitative results, just super briefly, we developed an initial version that we could put into practice that requires quite a lot of technical work. Um, once we got it into practice, um, we did some psychometrics, in this case based on IRT, uh, to identify some items that are simply not very uh, valuable from an information perspective. I hope you can see my mouse, but this graph on the right just shows that there's two items that contribute almost nothing to the eating problem scales. Um, and then we took that psychometric information and gave it to clinicians and patients and said, it looks like some of these items are doing well, some of them are helpful. What do you think? What, what else do we need? What is this construct missing? Um, how have you used this with your patients? Um, and they gave us a lot of information that we used to build the next version. And that showed marked improvements in psychometric performance with some still, still some clear areas to, to improve. We don't have very good measures of strength and resiliences, um, but we do have, have a, a much better instrument than we had before collecting the evidence and getting the evidence from clinical practice, right? And even the eating disorder scale has lost an item but actually gained information overall. And there's a more even spread of information across the items that, that we're still working towards. Um, I'm gonna skip this, even though I can talk for days about the Norse if I had to. Um, this is a section that I want to share that talks about whether or not the Norse is useful, right? A lot of people hear that the Norse has 20 scales or that, you know, they see a picture with lots of lines and think it's going to be confusing and not usable. Um, this is information provided by a company, so, so don't, you know, think of it as neutral information. Um, but uh, in communication with patients, um, almost all patients say that it's simple enough for them to use. Um, and uh, that it, most patients still say that it's important to their treatment and helps them communicate with their therapist, which is the goal um, explicitly of this product. Um, and when talking to providers, again, almost everyone thinks that it's useful, that it improves treatment, 
Um, most even say that it adds meaning. So, so that's, which is a very Norwegian type of question to ask. Um, and uh, four out of five apparently would, would use it if they had total control or at least say that they would um, to a survey uh, question put out by a company, right? But this is all evidence. I don't trust it all completely, but it is evidence that this is useful in practice, which is exactly what we need it to be. Okay, so that's enough of me talking about um, the Norse and I, I don't think I'm gonna bring up the Norse again, unless someone asks me about it, feel free to at the end. Let's move on to our second inference that we wanted to ask about, which is, has a patient improved? Um, this is really a question about change. Has there been change or not, right? You could easily say this has the patient deteriorated. Um, but, or has the patient changed? Um, change is notoriously and truthfully extremely difficult to measure. Um, it's much harder to measure than a snapshot and it's much harder to measure um, in psychological terms than even psychological snapshots or change in distances, right? That's because even though individual observations are noisy, error compounds over time, just like interest compounds, which is why, you know, people who invested, you know, some money in a bank 30 years ago or it can be millionaires. I don't know what the compound interest thing is. I'm not rich. Um, but I'm just gonna talk about a couple of reasons where we make big mistakes um, in psychotherapy research. Uh, and those are model error, which is actually quite similar to something I've already talked about. And then the RCI, which is my personal obsession as anyone who has talked to me in the last six months knows. Um, okay. so. What is a filter? <laughs> this is what I'm going to call the longitudinal filter. This was part of my dissertation. Those of you who are in grad school, um, I did the first analyses for my dissertation, I think, 10 years before I published it. Um, and I still have stuff for my dissertation I haven't published. So, like, it takes time. Um, but this is an idea that is obviously um, valuable to me and might be important clinically as well. The basic concept is that what changes over time is not the same as what differentiates two people, just as the filter, in this case, uh, changes over time, but the person is constant. Um, in the analysis I'm going to show, it's actually the opposite, is that the person um, changes, but we have to do some filtering of the, of the observations to see the change, the, the real change that's actually happening. Right. So it's actually the reverse filter of this. So if we go back to our measure of between person covariance models, it could well be the case for those of you who are familiar with you know, multi-level structural equation modeling, that there's that, that structure that was developed based on between person covariance uh, in the first place only shows up at the between person level of analysis. And that what happens within meaning across time is much more confusing, much more narrow or, or something else. Um, and we just don't know from having one observation per person, which, do, which provides us this lovely between person covariance structure. We just don't know what the within person is and we don't know if it's different, let alone how different it is from the between person. And we don't have any reason empirically to suspect that either one of these levels is the same um, as our overall model, right? Um, and this is work that was published last year. Finally, as I said, 10 years after the initial analyses were done. Um, and using multi-level factor analysis and, and data from routine care, right? These are people who had at least 10 observations in routine care, but generally weekly psychotherapy sessions, completing the CCAPs, um, in this case, the 34 item version of it, um, just as part of the normal treatment. Um, while the standard factor analysis models come to a seven factor solution, as would be the case for this and was the case for this instrument in its validation studies, the multi-level factor analysis basically shows that the, 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 the weird thing here is the between person, not the within person, right? So what actually happened was something kind of like this, where depression and eating between people seems to be sort of a general score. Right, it was much broader. The factor structure was much broader between people. Whereas the within person structure across the different scales um, was actually slightly narrower, but very similar to the previous structure. So as we still had a depression scale and an eating scale within, it's just that a couple of items seem to drop out um, here and there. If, so if all you wanted to measure was change, um, you could basically use the scale scores 
But if what you really want to know is the maximally valid differentiation between people, then you could use a total score or a general score. Um, and it's slightly more nuanced than this, but that was the overall version of that study. Um, this is not a personalized model in the way I was talking about before. This just simply extends factor analysis into a multi-level framework. Um, and it doesn't imply that this is the model for every person, just as between person covariance doesn't imply that everyone has the same structures. Um, but it does provide evidence that you can use narrow scores for change. There's converging evidence from different fields of psychopathology and emotion tracking and various EMA studies that what changes over time tends to be narrower things, not broad things. Um, so you might need actually fewer items to measure change, interestingly, than you need or, or can benefit from if you're only interested in telling people apart. Um, and it also shows that you can do this type of work pretty robustly, that these models fit reasonably well and, and um, all the power analyses, both a priori and um, simulation-based show that you can do this with very common structures of data from routine outcome uh, monitoring and psychotherapy. Um, and so this is a detectable, testable type of model. Um, and by today's standards, again, it's 10 years old and in the analysis, it's pretty simple. Um, okay, I said I would be done very soon, but I need to talk about the RCI. I love talking about the RCI. Um, apologies to anybody who loves the RCI. Um, the Reliable Change Index is one of the most famous findings for the last 30 years of psychology. It's, you know, it's, it's much older than that, obviously. Um, it goes back to the 1940s. Um, but it is something that is made famous by Jacobson and Truax. And it's the idea that if you have a different score or you have a pre-post score, you might wanna know, is the observed different score for a given person unlikely to be observed if there was no true, true score change? And that's a really convoluted way to ask a question. But that's what null hypothesis testing does to you. I have to ask convoluted questions, right? And the thing is that there's nothing wrong with the RCI. It's totally fine. Like there's really nothing wrong with it. It's super old. It goes back to longstanding classical test theory. It makes perfect sense within the assumption set that we are generally willing to make most of the time when we do parametric statistics. There's really nothing wrong with it, except that it's, almost never calculated correctly. It's almost never interpreted correctly in my experience. It, it results in actually with sort of this interesting paradox of both under and overconfidence in our measurements. Um, and it has produced just tremendous research waste. I'm convinced of these things. I hope I can convince you in five minutes or so. If I can't, you'll get to read about it very soon. Okay, so first thing to know about the RCI is that it's the simplest possible form of this equation. There are just as simple to implement forms that account for practice effects and very realistic deviations and standard deviations that are just the case all the time, right? We should almost never be using the RCI as Jacob and so in Truax use it, even if we want to, we should be using some of these alternative forms. Moreover, if you wanna go into different models, like you can get better results with more complex modeling um, that are, are freely available as well. And I can point you to if you're interested in. Um, the other thing is that it's become common to use alpha or some other internal consistency variable here instead of test retest. And this is just, um, you know, it's sort of me nitpicking and saying, don't do that. Um, test retest is fundamentally not internal consistency. They measure totally different things. This is actually one of the standards of best practice in measure development is that you don't confuse these two things. Um, and it's because they just mean totally different things. So what is test retest, right? You give a test, you give it again later, that period of time, the retest interval is defined, right? We have, to, we have to know what that is. And that is the period during which an examinee standing on the variable being there measured would not be expected to change. So it is person one is the same at time one as they are at time two. Um, and so the question is how quickly do scores on whatever you're measuring change? Do they change on every week, every two weeks? Do they change every day, or every hour? Um, and that's what you really need to be asking yourself. And moreover, you need to ask yourself, how likely is it that person one is the same place in the total distribution of all people at time one and time two, given how short your retest interval is? The retest interval that's appropriate is so short that that is what will happen, is that it will always be the exact same rank in the total population. 
every single person doesn't change break. That's what that retest interval means. It's super common that people use a two week interval when they're administering a, an instrument every week in practice, which means that when they administer it in practice, they assume it changes less than, a, it, more frequently than once every week, right? They assume it changes at least weekly, but it could have changed in between um, assessments. But when they do a retest, they use much longer interval periods even, which is the exact opposite of what we need. Really for a lot of outcome instruments that I'm interested in, the correct period is at most a day. Like a retest of one day is, is much preferable, um, which would tend to make the RCI very conservative as it is in practice. Um, moreover, how do we interpret the RCI? Well, it, we interpret it like a null hypothesis test. Many people know this. Um, the, that means that if there's a large change to change larger than the instrument's RCI, then you reject that there was no change, right? Then it wasn't no change. That, that's what you can say about that. Um, if it's smaller than the RCI, if the observed difference score is smaller than the RCI, you don't know what to say. The RCI gives you nothing in that case, right? It doesn't say that there's no change. It doesn't say that the change was unimportant. It just says, I don't know, right? It shrugs its shoulders at you. Um, some people interpret the RCI as a minimum detectable change. This is actually really common. It's canonized, in fact, in, in manuals even. Um, conventional measurement says that the smallest detectable change of an instrument is whatever the smallest increment is, right? And in fact, if you're measuring like grams, and I've done this because I've worked in a neurobiology lab, I was measuring micrograms, the smallest detectable change is half of whatever the unit is that you can actually measure, right? That's what a detectable change is, is half of what you see. Um, it's not 1.96 times the standard error of what you see. That is by no means minimum. Um, and then finally, like many people, because it came out of the field of clinical significance, interpret it to mean a clinically significant change or minimum important change. And it just has nothing to do with that. Like it's just fundamentally a totally different object. Like it, it may look like that occasionally or in some instruments be numerically similar, but it's based on a totally different concept. It has nothing to do with whether something matters in practice. Um, and you see all these all the time, right? Um, much more so, right? Even if you could calculate it correctly and interpret it correctly, you have this problem, which is the RCI is just wrong a lot. It's wrong so much. And I, I apologize that this is not more widely known because we really should have caught this earlier, guys. Um, here's just a, this is the theoretical map for when the RCI is right and when it's wrong. The higher the line goes, the, the more often an RCI will be right. The, the value on the x-axis here is the true change score. This is the thing that whether or not someone actually changed, right? The RCI is right less than half the time if the true change score is less than 1.96 times the standard error of the difference score, right? Unless it happens to be exactly no change because then it's 95% accurate, right? But people don't know change. That's a good double negative. People change. <laughs> we all change all the time in different ways. Um, like no change here, just like every other point null estimate is really meaningless, right? Um, the only way to get 95% total accuracy is either to have no change whatsoever in truth, or to have an effect that is almost four times larger than your error, in which case you should not be doing statistics. It is so clear at that point that there has been a change. You do not need the numerical summary, right? Then measurement is useless and precision won't help you. It's just like, these far extremes are really pointless to do math on, and the little point in the middle doesn't happen. Everywhere else, it's less than 95% accurate. Most of the time, it's gonna be less than 50% accurate. And the reason it does this, again, is that because measurement errors sort of randomly happening, when you start segmenting people into really big observed changes and really small ones, there's gonna be more people with really big observed changes who just had big measurement errors in that direction, right? They started really high. And so they had a huge change because they, they had this sort of, this progression to the mean effect, right? That, that's what that is. This is, these are biased measurement errors. Um, I know I didn't explain that well, but we'll move on. All of this adds up to the fact that the RCI as a total accurate measure, if, unless you have reliability at the level of an atomic clock, right, it will, always, always, always be considerably less accurate than just taking the sign of the different score and saying, if this person looks like they improved, let's call them improved. It will always, the RCA will always be 
much less accurate than just doing that because it can't tell you about the people in the middle. And when it tries to, it's always wrong. Um, now, just taking the difference score isn't great, right? There are better ways to do that. Um, and and I, like there are lots of better ways to do that, in fact. Um, but the RCI is much worse than that. And so we should just really not use it for that purpose. Moreover, the RCI generates research waste because people will frequently throw out interim time points, right? So it's designed for pre-post data, was developed you know, in the clinical sciences at a time when pre-post was really the data you had. Now we have interim data, we have weekly data, we have EMA data, we have lots of data points, lots of observations per person. You don't need to just ask whether two scores are different. You can ask if there's say a linear trend or other types of trend, and you can include measurement error in those evaluations or not, and you could include other people. You could do a lot of stuff. And what I'm showing here is just a simulation it's not real data, it's simulated data, but it's pretty similar uh, to what you would get with a reliability of 0.8. Um, and if you have more than two time points, there is always a superior way to calculate difference compared to the RCI, whether you want to count, um, classify everyone in your sample, in which case you can get 80% or higher total accuracy with, a, with 0.8 reliability, or if you just want to count, classify the people who are 95% that with type one error control, right? If you decide you want to do type one error control, you can use what I am sort of cheekishly calling the reliable trend index, um, which is the pink line here, which is always above the blue line. And it's always above because it just is more powerful, right? You have more data, you have more power, you don't need to throw away all of the interim time points. Um, and it is never worse. It just literally cannot be worse. Um, so, You'll see this published soon, I hope. Um, and then at the population level, this is all I mean, at the individual level, the RCI was bad. Population level, the RCI is really not what you wanna calculate. Um, I wrote a letter to the editor that, I don't know if it's gonna get uh, published or not, I just sent it in last week. Um, this is a really good meta-analysis by Pim Kuypers and, and colleagues um, that they, they estimated that 6% of people in the treatments for depression, these are adolescents, um, deteriorated and they estimated that because they estimate that 6% of people had observed change scores beyond the point of the RCI. Um, that's just not what the RCI was for and it doesn't tell you that they clinically significantly deteriorated, it just tells you that their observed score was big. Um, the true difference score is that 20% of people, or 19% technically, um, actually deteriorated in those treatments, which is still much better than the control conditions where more than a third of people actually deteriorate in, in care. Um, and so the RCI at the population level sort of really diminishes important findings um, and can convince us that our treatments are great. Hey, only you know, one out of 17 people deteriorate in treatment. Um, we actually need to be really cautious because one out of five people are getting worse, not to consider whether they make meaningful improvements or not, right? They're just getting worse. So. Um, I think the RCI is, is simply sort of not a recommendable uh, measurement. I, I, I have convinced myself of this and I, I have put all these things into a, a paper that I am hoping to resubmit very soon. Um, it's been six months since I submitted it initially. I haven't heard a single thing from the reviewers yet. So I'm hoping to eventually, um, but I've revised it anyway, made it better because there's been lots of stuff that's come up. Um, so I hope that uh, we can move past the RCI at some point soon. Um, and the problem with the RCI and the reason I included it in a measurement talk, right, is that it's not the RCI, it's not the measurement of change. It's that when we use the RCI to categorize people, we take the uncertainty inherent in test scores and we put it entirely onto the measurement instrument. And then we say this person changed with certainty and this person didn't with certainty, right? That's really the problem. It's not that we, are, are you know calculating the wrong thing or test retest like the fundamental problem with the RCI is that we are just not willing to sit with the fact that this person changed a little but maybe they didn't change positively maybe they also changed negatively we just can't tolerate being unsure even though that's what our measurement tools are capable of they're only capable of giving us probabilities and uncertainty that's our task right as scientific psychologist is to tolerate that certainty appropriately, minimize it as much as we can, but not totally erase it by trying to categorize people unduly. Um, 
All right, so if there's anything to summarize this meandering talk about, I'm not sure that there is, but if there is, um, it's that our measurements are probabilistic and imprecise, but that validity in psychology is much better and much more important than precision, right? That's really what we want is validity. And we don't need to care about precision for the sake of precision because we care about validity for the sake of validity. Um, and measurements aren't just taken in a vacuum, right? Every single test score can be contextualized and in fact needs to be contextualized in order to be interpreted with validity, right? If you don't contextualize, if you don't consider other scores, other contexts, other situations, you're very unlikely to have a valid measurement. Right? So um, I wanna thank some of my colleagues over uh, the years, people at Penn State, people in, in Norway, people in, in New York um, who have been really uh, impactful in my life, um, as well as I want to thank everyone here for coming and listening to me rant for almost a full hour. There is a little bit of time, I promise, for you know you to yell at me if you prefer to. Um, and I really am just, I couldn't be more grateful that anyone stuck through to the end. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, you know, I, for one, as any time that I hear you talk about measurements and statistics was blown away and there's a lot to, to sink in. Um, we do have a comment and question and hopefully we get more, um, but I'm going to, I know y'all can read it in the chat. I will just read it out loud. So it's preserved in our recording. Um, Kim says the RCI is extremely conservative, fully agree. Um, it's been criticized since its existence by many different researchers. Um, why do you think it's still being used on such a large scale and even seeing an increase in use? Yeah, I've wondered this um, as well, Kim. Like it's, um, I'm not the first person to think the RCI is bad. I'm not the first person to point out a lot of the criticisms that I would point out. Excuse me, um, and it, it it even you know like maybe the best strategy like you know dealing with an internet troll is simply ignoring them right maybe I just shouldn't write this thing and you know, I'm just drawing attention feeding feeding the flame um, I I don't know exactly why I have theories about why it's popular it seems right right it touches on sort of classical test theory at the level that we learn about it in grad school it sort of like implies that you can be certain about something that seems like we should be certain about. Right, and it, it's almost always correct when it bothers to provide an, an inference at all, which means that it's almost always correct when you want it to be, um, but it just, it you, and you don't see the, the costs as much, right? You don't see the fact that even when it says someone has improved, there's actually like a four or 5% chance that they deteriorated, or you don't see the fact that someone who you said, well, you didn't change enough, um, or you didn't change uh, you didn't get a lot worse, actually deteriorated under your care, right? You just don't see that or you don't treat that as part of the RCI's function. And so it doesn't, it doesn't bear the costs that it actually incurs, um, the patients do, right? At least that's my theory. Um, plus it's, it's, it's simple, like it's a formula that at least if you think about it, it makes sense. Um, and you don't have to be, you know, a statistician or a expert in calculus it doesn't have any big sigma functions or anything like that so people like it because they think it does what they want it to i think even though it really doesn't i think fantastic and well well timed we have another comment and questions in the chat from mark um, who says thank you for a very interesting talk on a very important issue um, can you give us some advice on first steps to start to realize personalized measurement? How do we organize our routine um, outcome measurements in a way that we can create a more personalized way of measuring change? Yeah, um, it's such a great question. And I think that um, there would be so many ways to go about um, doing it that, you know, you would need to ask yourself what you wanted from a personalized measure. And I'm going to pull up a slide just to have something up on the screen that, that might be relevant. Um, the question is, do you want a fully personalized measure? In which case, you know, you're really doing quite a lot of work with each patient, or do you want a partially personalized measure in which you're doing still quite a lot of work with each patient or something else? And do you want it to be a statistical model or a clinical model? Um, which is really the difference between the 
uh, patient generated outcome measures, which are really a clinical personalization, and these ones, which are really statistical personalization. Um, I have you know, only good things to say about the, the, the patient generated outcome measures that are here. Um, they have really excellent clinical utility. They have been shown to have really great um, psychometric properties when they're used in the way that they're intended to, at least the personal questionnaire and the cyclopsum. I, I don't know the goal attainment scale as well personally. Um, but those are really excellent tools for how developing a structured way towards personalization. Um, but they require some work in getting used to. Um, and the, the more statistical models, I think, at this point require a fair amount of integration with a technology platform. And so you have to have digital measurement and capacity to um, implement pretty complicated algorithms. Um, so those may just be off the table or they might be exactly what you want. I'm not sure. But I, I would point you to sales and others um, who go through some of these uh, measures and some of their history and some of their validity um, evidence and describe their use with them. That'd be my first recommendation if you're interested in patient-generated outcomes. We have a few minutes, so if, if anyone you know, raises a hand or puts a question in. Um, this, or as still... a response or an additional recommendation to um, Mark, that'd be great. Absolutely. I'm sure that, yeah, people in the audience might have good ideas. Uh. I guess as, as we wait to see if those kinds of things come in, I will say that I was particularly struck, you know, going into the talk with the title of, you know, how um, clinical experience might guide our measurement, uh, particularly of these two main inferences that you talked about. Um, I was struck by the, the process with developing the Norse, you know, the people were sticking sticky notes on a board to kind of break down these different constructs of, of how they, how clinicians and patients see them occurring in, in real life. I was wondering if there's, you know, similar evidence or, um, I guess just examples of that being done for the measurement of change. Um, and maybe, you know, Mark's question gets at this as well. Yeah, that's a fascinating question. Um, there, so all of that work, all of the work in, in that, that area that I'm aware of, and I don't know, maybe Kim or, or any number of other people on the call may also know, um, but um, the work that sort of speaks to that of, of talking to getting quality, getting feedback on how did you change? What, what did the measure capture or not capture as part of your change is still primarily qualitative. Um, and I think that, that that has meant that it hasn't caught as much attention as it probably deserves. Um, and I think that that's something that, that we need to pay more attention to as a field and really value because it is clinical utility. And in medicine now, a lot of psychometric development in medicine is much more qualitatively focused. Um, than even in psychology, which is really to our shame. Like we should be the ones who are expert in that. Um, but there are groups who are, who are looking at that, including uh, Celia Salas and um, if I said her name right, I'm not sure. And um, uh, Kevin Krauss and uh, Miranda Wolport, um, all doing really excellent work to talk to patients and clinicians about what changes and what doesn't. And I see Kim's question, should I just read it out? Um, recently network analyses have become quite popular as a method of personalizing outcome measurements. How does that fit in with your approach? Is that something you're working on? Um, so I'm not an expert in network analyses. I haven't made the leap to try to pursue that. I've, I've sort of stuck with my, my latent variables for now. Um, network analyses seem really great. They seem potentially very valuable. Um, and I don't want to mischaracterize them because I'm not as fluent as many people even on the call, I'm sure. Um, I like latent variables because I think summaries of item responses are valuable. Um, and a lot of network analysis uh, typically focus on individual items. Um, to answer Mark's question just straight away, uh, they're usually based on group level covariance, just like uh, 
factor analysis models, but they're not exclusively. In fact, um, there's a version of network analysis that's very common that's equivalent to doing a um, uh, an IRT type model, a very simple IRT type model. So, which is, is very similar to, in fact, and equivalent to a constraint factor analysis model. So, under the hood, there's quite a lot of similarity between networks and factors, um, but it's a difference of focus. That's a difference of presentation. Um, I I think the, the bigger question is network theory and whether that suits psychopathology well or the understanding of a clinician well. Um, and there are cases where it certainly will. Um, I can think of individual patients, you know, for anxiety, for instance, for whom you could have a network of symptoms that has a pretty clear causal chain in it, right? I avoided, so I felt guilty, so I uh, tried to push myself even harder, so I felt worse about it when it failed, and I felt worse and avoided more, right? Like the procrastination can be a good network model of causes, um, but it also works as a factor model, right? And in different cases, one is going to be better than the other for theoretical reasons. So my, my perspective is that we should be thinking about the network theory and the latent variable theory um, much more so, and the utility of using each one. But I'm interested in other people's perspectives on that as well. Fantastic. Yes, and I, I think it's a testament to the importance and the interest um, that there is in questions of psychotherapy measurement. Um, but we are at time, and um, I think we should, you know, wrap up this talk. But I'm sure that you know Andrew would be happy to receive questions online, not to throw them under the bus. Um, yeah, but, totally. Uh, whether it's you know, reaching out to him or you can contact um, the, the email that's uh, sent you the Zoom links um, and we will forward questions along. Please do. Super. All righty. Hope everyone has a great day, evening, um, or night. Thank you. All righty. Appreciate it. Bye.